a playlist original. Well, a, a boy's best friend is his mother. Kill her, mommy. Kill her. We'll tear your soul apart. Live or die. What that fly? I hope they are watching. They'll see. They'll see and they'll know. And they'll say, that she wouldn't even have a fly. All right, hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Back to the Blockbuster with your host Gaius and Jackson, the final episode of our Tales of Horror limited series. It's very bittersweet. Yes. As he wipes a tear from his eye, I don't know, it's a, a lot bit. of fun. I can't believe. I mean, it did feel like it went by really fast, but I still can't believe that. It just felt, I mean, it was just a couple short months ago. We were had all this in front of us, and now we're at the end. And it's been something that uh, I know we've both been really looking forward to chatting about. And uh, here we are. It's my favorite time of the year, and it's sad that it's going. Yeah, it, you know, it was something that, like, we kind of, I think, both kind of were like, oh, let's do this on a whim. And then it kind of worked out because the strikes mm. were going on, so there was no real news to talk about of significance. Right. And um, like I've been talking about before, we thought this was going to be like kind of like we have so much time to like talk about so many movies because it's two months. <laughs> um, and we did cover a lot. It was, oh, hell yeah. Uh, but it it came and went really quick. And um, yeah, a little bittersweet because like yeah, bittersweet. Yeah, exactly. It was, it was, it was it, and it was fun. We, had, we got to have like, uh, I guess personally think like every guest that we've had on since we started. Uh, it was all really uh, fun mm-hmm. getting to know like different podcasters and all that we just guessed it on uh someone's show that was like on our first episode of this yes return uh, of Ben's so resurrection was great to see them again like a full circle moment yes uh, cuz like as we end this and uh got to be on their show um but we we the, i guess what we learned from this is that we do want to do more limited series so this will not be the last one that's right um there, and it's- they'll all be a little different it's too fun just splurging on stuff that we actually like want to talk, which uh, of course we love covering the news and that's not going anywhere. I don't imagine when news is more rampant, but uh, it is just too much fun to dedicate certain, you know, whether it be like director showcases or specific genre stuff like this, it's stuff that we both really love. And I think it would be, you know, we wouldn't be doing ourselves any favors by not doing it going forward after the fun that we had with the tales of horror. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's pretty safe to say that I know this is like well in advance, but like, you know, this time next year, um, we will probably this will be a, a thing that we would do again. A hundred percent. So locked in. Uh, locked in and probably, you know, a, maybe a little bit more planning with like what movies are going to pick. Uh, but yeah. And, and there's and maybe more um, obscure ones probably, too. But like, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, this was a good uh, a good first uh, edition of that. And I got to see a couple of movies I had never seen before. I'm like, I didn't. The Wailing was one of them. I had never seen right. that. And that was, and I'll even throw in the deep dive Lake Mungo stuff because that was still kind of horror related. I had never seen that either. So that was fun. How and often got, do you get to say that? I know, not very, not very no. often at all. And I got to throw some stuff at you that, you know, wasn't always like perfect, but it still had fun. Uh, I mean, in the nature of just watching horror movies and covering them around Halloween time, uh, there's nothing I would have changed, even though I didn't love everything. It's, I still love watching them. So. Sure. It, was a, it was a blast route. And now we're recording this on Monday, October 30th. So I think we both have 
some plans to watch more horror movies independently. Uh, yes, yeah, I know I'm not doing anything tomorrow. I did all of my Halloween fun stuff with my friends yeah. Friday, Saturday, and a little bit on Sunday. Um, I, I, we, I got a text from a couple people that were like, "Hey, are you going out Tuesday?" And I was like, "No." Nope. Going to be firmly like in my bed all day watching. How do you? Stuff. Yeah, do you do you know <laughs> what you're planning on watching yet? I don't know. There's certain stuff that like I kind of save for Halloween. Like I always watch like Psycho like first thing in the morning on like Halloween. Nice. Um, That's a good tradition. I got that in this this year already. I know you already watched yeah. it. And then there's certain things I haven't watched yet. Like I usually watch like The Lost Boys around this time. And I haven't watched that yet. So mm. maybe that. I know. Of course. uh I kind of went ahead and watched Halloween already because that's what we're covoring today. Right. Um, Otherwise, I'd save that for the day. I would, but maybe I'll like switch it up. I mean, I, I maybe I'll watch Halloween Ends tomorrow because I haven't watched it since either. So right, I'll be watching that. at least one or two. Uh, that's what I plan on getting in is David Gordon Green's movies. Uh, I'll probably start with 2018, uh, and maybe if I'm feeling particularly extravagant i might sneak in kills and i'll probably end with ends later this week i know i won't get in all three tomorrow but traditionally over the last few years i've just kind of switched up what halloween movie i would watch on the day so it looks like yeah. this year it'll be david gordon greens again i've watched rob zombies and carpenters over the years too on the day but it's just not halloween without watching one of them yeah it's true and i actually i pro promised someone uh, I shouldn't have promised this, but on G Reels, I would try to watch Rob Zombie's Halloween Two again. And maybe, oh, maybe I'll do it. To, okay. Maybe I'll do it tonight. Maybe I'll just like, like just. When did I feel you like watch I can't the first watch, one again? Well, I, yeah, I, I hadn't. So maybe I feel like I can't watch Halloween Two without watching his Halloween. Mm. Not, not especially thrilled for that double feature, but <laughs> I mean, I might as. Well, but I feel like I can't watch one without the other. I guess well, that's how I feel. Like, I know that you're you're a completionist complete. like me, and it, to me, it's it's tough. Like this is why I had to watch Halloween two before we covered four. I hadn't seen it before, and I didn't want that yeah. to impact. So, I mean, once you get around to seeing a movie a certain amount of times, it doesn't you don't necessarily have to do it that way. But if you haven't seen Rob Zombie's first one in a while, it might sweeten you to the sequel. Even though the it's been a bit, it's been great. a bit. I was just yeah, recommending it's... Rob Zombie's first one to my buddy Tyler, like right before we jumped on here, and I think he might bite and do it. Oh, I think I might do it tonight too. And mm. yeah, we are, we are surrounded by a, like a lot of uh, Halloween anniversaries. So like earlier in August, it was twenty five for H two O, and then we did mm -hmm. thirty five for Halloween four. Today we're covering the first movie because it just turned forty five last week. Right. Uh, this is not this is not a milestone anniversary anniversary, but we're recording today. Uh, Halloween two came out forty one years ago today. Uh, so it's just a lot of uh, Halloween. Uh, <sighs> stuff going on from that franchise also on twitter on twitter they have like it's michael myers monday so they everyone that is a horror movie fan like tags all their favorite michael myers stuff on that's social cool. media yeah so it's just, it's especially heightened on the day before halloween so yeah <laughs> if there's one thing you can appreciate from rob zombies if nothing else michael myers is a fucking wrecking ball badass scary motherfucker in those movies like i love how he's portrayed yeah. and his his, his character credit to tyler main uh, is tyler awesome. main i i don't have a lot of you know i have some complaints but tyler main was never uh one of them i thought that right. he all things considered was a very good Mike. like the kind of Michael Myers that rob zombie wanted uh yeah. you know menacing them and physically imposing and also another example of when you get like an actual actor to play a part like that because i think he cared a lot about that role to not just be someone that just like walks from point a to point b he wanted to like right dig a little deeper i think and i think he does a really good job so i don't and he's also a very nice person person i met him at the halloween <laughs> convention oh, okay the, right yeah was, super, yeah because i i wasn't sure i wanted to meet anyone from rob zombies <laughs> halloween <laughs> oh, my buddy was like let's go to their panel and see what they see how it is and like mm -hmm. actually they were most of them were very nice i think they kind of they all kind of feel like they're uh in this kind of small little like hey some people love us some people don't like us but the people that do love us really love us and right kind of have this like ragtag we're all in this together kind of group uh mm -hmm. thing going on with the people in those movies so i respected that i mean and they all really care about the franchise as a whole so right can't, uh, well it, i'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts if you do get around to watching either of rob zombies movies because yep, uh, you'll be the first one i message i think fantastic great <laughs> right? i can't wait can't wait for it um uh, uh, i was just gonna interject yeah. there and say before we get too yeah, far ahead. into the episode um of course we'd have to just touch a little bit on 
the passing of Matthew Perry, who died uh, earlier this week. Uh, he was 54, I believe. Um, yeah. Friends actor Chandler Bing from Friends. I know it's probably no secret by now. I'm sure lots of our listeners are fans of the show. And I'm not, it's something we haven't really covered, you and I, before. I was curious. We hadn't talked about it. But uh, what's yeah. your connection to, to him and to Friends? I know he's been in a couple other movies, too. Yeah, he has. Um, so full disclosure, I'm gonna, this is going to sound like bad at first, but then it gets better, I swear. Um, compared to like most of my friends, uh, you know, my generation, um, I like friends, but I'm not like a die hard fan of the no, show. No, I'm the same. Well, I haven't even seen the whole show or even a whole season of the show. Just like, yeah, like I have, fr- and- I have friends that could, like, if it came down to it, that could dominate friends trivia, win us a bunch of money if necessary, if that's right. all that they had to, like, if that's all they had to talk about. Uh, right. But what I do take from it is that when I have watched it, um, he was always, uh, I mean, I don't want to say just of the guys. I mean, I think in general, the, the whole cast, there was something about his comedic timing that stood out compared to everyone else's. Um, yeah. And I always thought that he was incredibly hilarious and, um, even though, even if I wasn't like you know a friends connoisseur, I still respected uh, very much so what he, what he brought to that show. And then I got to see that in other stuff that he was in, like movie wise. Like uh, I, I don't, I have no problem with admitting that there are some rom coms that I enjoy. I actually like uh, <laughs> the one he did with the one we did with Selma Hayek back in the day. It's called Fools Rush In. They're very good in it together. Um, he I also loved the whole Nine Yards. It's a really funny movie with him and Bruce Willis. Uh, and he, you know, he had like an up and down career after Friends right. ended. And, you know, there's no secret that he struggled a lot while on Friends and a little after that with uh, drug addiction and alcohol addiction. But he got through that. And mm-hmm. um, I watched a lot of his interviews last year when he was promoting his memoir. And, like, he really wanted to, like, make that book and... Yeah. have that be have that be an example you know if people were struggling with something and they read that and it made them better they it made them seek help that's what he wanted that to be and he you know i i, I don't want to i'm going to butcher the exact quote but i guess um what he wanted to be remembered more for than friends was that he wanted to be remembered as someone that maybe could help someone else if they really needed the help whether they heard right. a story or if he helped them directly um you know, I learned this news. We were at uh, a bar with friends and everyone was on their phones and it was a packed bar doing the Ohio State uh, football game. And it was a collective. It felt like everyone read it at the same time. It was really, really? weird. Yeah, wow. it was like completely surreal. And like it was really like, whoa, like kind of took the wind out of our sails a mm-hmm. little bit. Definitely. And, uh, you know, super 54 is young. Like it's oh god yeah really really young, and you know I I I have have like seeing all the outpouring of love and support from people who have worked with him or just admired him. I just read now that the um it looks like the cast of Friends wrote a statement together, uh to People Magazine, and it, it just says uh, we were all so utterly devastated by the loss of Matthew. We were more than just castmates. We are a family. There is so much to say, but right now we're going to take a moment to grieve and process this unfathomable loss. Um, in time, we will say more as when we are able. For now, our thoughts and our and our love are with Maddie's family, his friends, and everyone who loved him around the world. I'm really glad because sometimes when this stuff happens, like people that don't know better on social media are like, oh, like when's like Jennifer Aniston going to say something? Like when is Courtney Cox going to say something? And right, we have no idea what this is like for them. They were super tight. I mean, I, they, I, you know, if anything. Sometimes with TV shows, you watch them and then sometimes you learn later that like, oh, so-and-so didn't go along. And like, you know, that favorite thing that you loved about the show is like kind of not real. But what I gathered from friends is that they all very much liked each other, loved each other, in fact. Um, and they are all bonded by this very successful thing that they got to do together. Because mm-hmm. when they because when they all got the show, they were all it was kind of like they were still struggling actors and like, oh, is this thing going to be what we think it is and of course it turned into something majorly successful right. yeah and there's something to be said about having that understanding with your cast mix because they only they only really get that i think what it was like to go through that whirlwind i mean i've always respected the fact that they're one of the i think the first cast uh every one of them when it came down to renegotiating their contracts toward the end of the show's run and they all were getting they all were like we 
want to get the same amount. So it was like a million dollars per episode. That it was the biggest show on NBC. It wasn't this whole thing like, well, he's a lead and this person's a co-lead. Like, no, we are all leads together. We all want to get paid this same amount of money. Right. And they fought for that. Wow. And I think the Big Bang Theory uh, cast did the same thing. And like, and that's something they spoke of as like, you know, an inspiration for that. So they were always in that kind of thing together. And I kind of, I've always respected that, even though I wasn't a huge fan of the show. Like, right. You know, some of my contemporaries are. Um, but yeah, it's tragic. And super young and he was super talented. I think he, I think his uh, comedic skills, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, they did get a lot of respect when he was here, but I, I feel like a lot of people are going to be watching either old episodes of Friends or catching some of his movies and be like, oh, this guy really had like it. Yeah. He was, I, thought he, I thought he was really, you know, solidly funny dude. So I, I don't know what 100%. your kind of exposure is to him, but not much beyond the casual episodes of Friends that I plopped in and saw. Like I, I had friends and girlfriends that were fans of the show over the years. And I would sit down and see some of it with them. And I had always admired and liked what I'd seen of the show. It just, I'm not much of a comedy guy, even with shows just I spent my time watching other things, but was never keen to turn off an episode of friends. I always would watch it through. And he in particular uh, was a quite the presence to see on screen and definitely will be missed. I'll make sure in the coming weeks and months, definitely to keep an eye open and see, uh, what's recommended i'm sure i'll go and binge a few episodes just to pay my respects but yeah definitely a sad loss for the sitcom community and the, the movie and tv community in general and just for everyone that grew up or whenever you discovered friends and and uh, matthew perry it's definitely a loss a lot of people are feeling and yeah it's uh very unfortunate and he'll be very missed yeah. and yeah, yeah. I agree. yeah i mean it's uh yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I, I, as I'm saying it now again, like I wasn't a, a huge fan of the show, but I did watch that uh, reunion thing they did on HBO Max, and um, again, that was very interesting to watch too. Like, as someone that's just like a casual watcher of that show, mm -hmm. it was so cool to see them look back on like something they did together that was made a lot of history and like it was a huge, big deal. Yeah. And uh, I think he said something in particular that I you can kind of tell when you're watching it is that he always was like chasing like the big laugh like the biggest joy he got was like hearing the audience like kind of like roar because it's something funny that he did and you can really yeah. tell that in a lot of the stuff on friends where it's not just not in an annoying way either like this is someone that's just like you know he wants to make the audience feel good and you can tell that mm -hmm. uh with some of his stuff i mean like there are certain episodes i watch where his energy is just like contagious mm -hmm. like he's just like it's off the charts contagious and they and then I think they all played well off of each other because of that. They all brought something very different to the show. Absolutely. Um, and you know, you know, he he had a he had some successful films. He had some not so successful films. And, you know that he TV shows that didn't really work the way Friends worked. And um, I'm I'm sure that got to him initially. But I think he, from what I've read and seen, he got to a place where like his bigger mission in life was to kind of educate and help people who yeah i've been going through like depression and addiction and all that stuff like he had a a bigger plan for himself than just being a celebrity and if he and can I've, use his friends platform to do that then you know so I, be it. I think that'll ultimately be his legacy too right yeah. i think so too uh but yeah we wanted to acknowledge it because it was a big a really big story and it's still like an unfolding story i also yeah. agree with uh, Alyssa milano posted on her uh instagram she said like you know it really doesn't matter how he died exactly because i know a lot of people are trying to speculate like exactly what happened it's been kind it's of annoying more about, hearing yeah it's more about how they stuff. yeah already before anything yeah you know it is you know if you find out what you find out then so be it but like i think she made a good point to say like it shouldn't matter how he died it should be it should matter how he lived and i uh i agree with that so it's a great you know, statement so really uh wanted to even though it's a sad thing i think we can take a lot of positive stuff from it like you said you might catch some stuff from friends in like the coming mm -hmm. weeks and months. I might find myself watching it in a different way. Mm -hmm. I might appreciate it more in a, you know, in a much different way now. So, you know, the, I guess the one positive thing when like someone like this passes away, they, they usually leave behind like so many things that we can look back on and like enjoy and appreciate. And no matter how you feel about friends that, I mean, that show is a behemoth in and of itself. I mean, mm -hmm. it just really was, I mean, you know, 
it's so crazy to think about like what sitcoms were back then, you know, because we don't really have a lot of that now anymore. Right. And, uh, you know, NBC must see TV was a huge thing uh, during that time period. You had like friends and Seinfeld and Will and Grace. And these are where <coughs> people were staying home to actually watch TV, you know, yeah. before DVR. Tens of millions and before, of viewers. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, can you imagine now hearing a TV show getting like 40 million viewers a week? Mm. No, but. Back in that day, it was, you know, people, that was appointment television for people. Yeah. So it's a, it's a bygone era without a doubt. Yeah. It's it's trippy to think about. Yeah. Uh, It really is. Um, But in other kind of like record breaking kind of news talking about like uh, in the case of TV, 40 million viewers a week of box office uh, this weekend, it's been (laughs) ebbing and flowing since the SAG SAG and writer's strike started. We've had some big, opening weekends we've had some that could have been better maybe if their stars could promote the movie um in the case of five nights at freddy's i don't think it mattered that the cast couldn't really promote the movie uh and because it gross initially 78 million dollars they reported on Sunday. it went higher it, it went up to 80 million dollars today and the actuals are like they just released them a couple of hours ago um wow. this is the Best opening for Blumhouse ever. It beats uh, the Halloween 2018 opening weekend of 76.2 million. Uh, this is the best opening weekend for going like considered Halloween weekend. It's also the fifth biggest uh, opening of October behind Joker, which had 96.2 million. Taylor Swift Eras Tour, which had 92.8 million. It's opening weekend. Venom, Let There Be Carnage, 90 million, and Venom, 80.2 million. Uh, no matter how you look at it, it's just a really successful opening weekend. And um, like from out of nowhere, it seems like as somebody who saw it, what, what do you have to say about those numbers? So, I didn't see this coming at all. I, I was I thinking didn't more just either like flop or like flop. like mediocre. Yeah. Well, I didn't see it coming because I just thought like, hey, they're releasing this on Peacock and in theaters. So I yeah. I, um, on the on the surface, it seemed like they had no faith in it, but then like tracking started coming out and. And then I read on how popular the game was, and it's all like, oh, this is like a generational gap because I never played it and I had never even right. heard of it um before this oh, movie came out. Hadn't even heard uh, of it. Okay. I never I never even heard of it. So, I never played um, it or even seen footage, but I was aware of it. That's about it though. So I was like, if this movie because they were like the tracking was 50 million heading to the weekend. 80 million <sighs> is uh and Holy this shit. and this kind of like I mean it did what it needed to do it was a big theatrical hit and i i'm hearing that it might be the biggest debut on the peacock streaming service which previously was halloween ends a year ago um so that um and then 132 million dollar global opening weekend too so this movie is already financially successful i won't be surprised if there is a sequel because i from what i heard my brother was trying to fill me in on stuff and i guess there's like all these like kind of like spinoffs and other stories are connected to five nights at freddy's where they could expand on it apparently it's Um, got quite a dense lore i'm told it really does and i saw it on thursday so the preview night um it's packed it was completely sold out nice and um i was entertained by there's some script flaws like little things that you can nitpick about but it was entertaining um but what i kind of was into more is that like there was stuff clearly that only fans of the game would get and then the crowd would just like laugh and kind of cheer where mm-hmm. I didn't understand what was going on, but right. they clearly understood what was happening. And, uh, and it was fun for them. And like, now this movie got abysmal reviews from critics, but I'm going to say that this is what yeah. it wasn't made for them. No, a and, lot of them I'm sure have not played the games. No, it wasn't made for them. And you know, that is, for, I, someone described this too, that this is a good gateway horror film for younger kids. If they wanted to get into the horror genre, this could be a movie to watch that's not too scary, but it's still kind of like appears to be a little bit more edgy than like, you know, uh, a kid's horror movie. Um, Just out of curiosity, so that, like what sort of body count are we dealing with in this movie? Like five plus, uh, 10 plus? Like, is it, I didn't get the sense that it was going to be much of a, like you get I'm a couple characters in the trailer and I'm assuming they make it to the end. And I was like, where, where, who are these victims in this movie from the trailers didn't give much away. Right. So there are not counting the, uh, 
<laughs> by the way i had to like confirm this was like not a movie story it's actually a part of the game i had no idea aside okay. from the ad- abducted children whose like bodies are put into the animatronics and they okay. possess them because there's there's five i think there's five okay there's five of those kids but like in the movie you get like four uh okay. kills and most of them are done kind of like off screenish or more obscure it's pg-13 okay um, so there's not a lot they can show but there were some like creepy like film making moments in it. it it's not scary i wasn't scary but like there's some okay. well-crafted scenes Josh Hutcherson's really good as the lead. I just realized I feel like I hadn't seen him since like the Hunger Games movies. Like, yeah, you know? I can't think of anything he's been in <laughs> yeah. since then. Nothing significant. Um, but he was really good, and Matthew Lillard is in it as well. So there's a nice <laughs> no little, way. Yeah, I did not know that. Like, That's awesome. So that was fun too. Um, you know, I I enjoyed it. I mean, I think there's okay. some begrudges out there who were like, you know, if yeah, I mean, of course it wasn't made for you. Um, I think was really telling because horror usually gets like not great cinema scores. This one got an A minus, so that means like the, the opening night, the opening night target audience really rallied behind it and really yeah. supported it. And a video so, game adaptation like that's unheard of, right? And I like, yeah, and that, again, again, that's usually yeah, res, yeah, you're right. That's another it's a good thing to point out. Um, so yeah, I I think so. I, one of the writers on for sinister he was on twitter and he was saying like i think any uh kind of win like this for the genre is just good for the genre as a whole so even if you didn't love five night at freddy's Mm -hmm. uh, having a horror movie open to 80 million dollars i mean like this is one of the like i mean behind it's behind uh it chapter two and it as one of the biggest as one of the biggest opening weekends for a horror film ever wow so i mean so company that is a I think it is. I agree. That's the win for the horror genre, just in general. Absolutely. So, well, hats I mean, off to the crew behind Five Nights at Freddy's. That was a. I'm sure many people did not expect that. Uh, myself and yep. you, yourself included, definitely um, would not have thought it would go anywhere near these heights. So that's without a doubt oh. fantastic news for the genre and for everyone involved. So nice to I have mean, a I if, underdog story. I wonder if Universal wish they put more marketing muscle behind that instead of the Exorcist because they this Blumhouse released <laughs> the Exorcist and that within weeks of each other. I mean, they gave Five Nights at Freddy's. I mean, it was a good weekend, I guess, to open it. But I was like, I wonder if they would have pushed it up a little bit so it could like take advantage of October more because really it only has this one weekend, and I'm sure it'll do really well tomorrow uh, on Halloween night uh, too. Mm-hmm. Um, where it goes from here, it, we don't really know. It could be extremely front loaded and like collapse crazy next week, but it has a little real competition next weekend. And mm-hmm. even if even if it does collapse like crazy, it's still going to turn like a massive profit for uh, Blumhouse and Universal. Yeah, too. yeah. Uh, and it, and, it, and it drove subscribers to Peacock because that's what they wanted to do as well. So okay, there you go. It went for them. Um, I'll I can drop it in the Dropbox if you want. It's not bad. I mean, I know you're not going to watch it like anytime soon, but it's not like. Uh, it's perfectly fine way to you know pass like almost two hours. Okay, yeah, well, feel free if you'd like. Yeah, I'm sure I get around it. I mean, soon after Halloween, I'll be off the horror binge for a bit, but you never know. I'll I'll dip back, I'll dip my toes back in just like I do throughout the year. Are you gonna be like period dramas? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> my typical typical stuff. I uh, and then I'm sure we'll have some anniversaries to get through. Um, but I don't really know what I have lined up next or what's gonna cross my. Uh, my list, but yeah, I'm kind of up in the air about that too. Like, but thinking about Martin Scorsese's The Irishman, I wanted to get that in before Killers of the Flower Moon, so I might go back to that. Oh, there we'll we see. go, long movie. Yeah, gotta buckle All up. All right, All right. so I'm gonna throw some kind of rapid fire horror movie news your way. Okay, see what you think of it. Sure, um, and kind of sequel news. Uh, The Black Phone 2 is set for summer 2025. Uh, that's all we really know about it is that it's going to be open on June 27th, 2025. And uh, the company behind the movie, which is also Blumhouse Universal. Right. When they, when they announced this sequel, they said the black phone two is the launch of a sinister new franchise. <laughs> so I feel <laughs> like they are words there having Scott yeah. Derrickson be directing. Yeah. And sinister. <laughs> um, yeah. And 
and also for those that don't know, the original movie starred Ethan Hawke as a child abductor and murderer called the Grabber. And Mason Thames is a 13 year old boy named Finney who crosses the killer's path. The Grabber locks Finney in a soundproof basement where nobody can hear him or come to his rescue. His only hope is a disconnected telephone that begins ringing. And when Finney answers it, he realizes he's able to communicate with the spirits of the Grabber's deceased victims. Did you see this movie? I did. I saw it in theaters last year. Really, really liked it. It was on my list, uh, like my best of the of 2022 lists. I, I'm not sure where oh, I yeah. ranked it. Not top 10 or anything, but I mean, it was up there. Yeah. Uh, I love Scott Derrickson as a filmmaker. I even his, uh, I think he did Sinister 2 as well. Did he not? Did uh, he either one? he might, I don't know if he directed it, but he might have had like a writing credit on it. In any case, I really Sin- Sinister is great. Though. Yeah, Sinister is great. I rewatched it this Halloween season. I don't think I got the chance to mention that. Um, and I really liked uh, the black film. Ethan Hawke in particular, too, putting out a villainous performance was really, really unexpected, really and he did a great job. That being said, I did hear this news uh, when it came out, and I, I can't really say I'm excited for it. I thought the black film worked wonderfully as a one-off. Nothing about it really made me want to come back Do to this story. I think it, there could be some some prequel, you know, yeah, uh, that's the only thing I work there, but happen. I... I don't need to see the story go anywhere else, but well, it, it did well. I'm guessing well enough to warrant a sequel. So yeah, um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, 160 million dollars worldwide uh, when it came out. Uh, it also was uh, positively reviewed by, by most critics, so I get why they wanted to make one. I just didn't see any sequel opportunities from it. That's what I'm having thinking. Yeah. It. Um, so this might be one of those financially motivated things. Yeah, um, like most of them are, which is unfortunate. But if the whole creative team's behind it, then I could probably get behind it too. But it I'm sure it'll be worth what, seeing. Yeah. What the ideas are. Um, so that's one. And another one is from today. Uh, I already know David where you're Rob- going. Director <laughs> David Robert Mitchell and Ika Monroe are reuniting on They Follow, a sequel to the critically acclaimed horror hit It Follows. Uh, Neon, the Oscar winning studio behind Parasite, will co produce the movie and release it domestically. The studio will uh, were introduce it to international buyers at this year's American film market and filming will begin sometime in 2024. So okay. um, another movie that I didn't think really warranted a sequel, but um, everyone seems very excited about it online. That was a, I, yeah, I, I don't yeah. know how I feel about it either really though. <laughs> um, I didn't know. I didn't know that uh, what the title, the working title was for the sequel until you <laughs> mentioned it. Cause I did, I did <laughs> see this today. I just saw a glimpse of it on Instagram. Might've been very well, may have been your post. Um, and I didn't really think one way or another about it. My instant thought was, oh, fucking great. Like another great horror movie that is getting a sequel. But now yeah. that I think about it, it's been nine years. It'll, it'll be 10, maybe 11 years after the first that this one comes out. And yeah. that is, is doing something for me. Like, I think that clearly like the, the first one's a phenomenon. Great. Like not, yeah. not by any means anymore, uh, underrated, but for a while was kind of under the radar horror movie. I remember yeah. seeing that for the first time and watch it several times afterwards and it was felt like this cult hit from out of nowhere in like the early a24 days even though it's not an a24 i don't believe but same kind of feeling feels feels like it It could be like a cousin to a24 um so i think like it's coming out at the right time clearly this wasn't just a movie that was shit out the next year because the first one did well and I, i that's doing something for me like i feel good about the timing in between it and yeah although i love and think it follows would be a f- wonderful one-off. It ends on this ambiguous note that I think you could very true take time to develop a sequel out of it. And the, uh, the fact that they, the the name implies like more like being going yeah. to it today. I think that's kind of slick. So I, I'm more yeah. on board with this than I thought I would be, but it'll all come down to if they are able to cleverly sort of construct a narrative that has a, a, a good working theme, like it follows does. Yeah. It'll that'll be like the bread or butter or the breaking point, I guess. We'll see what I think. Really I'm more into this, it. more into this than the sequel to the Black Phone. Agreed, sure. myself as well. There's more potential there, um, but Agreed. I, you know, if in case in case people are wondering why you're getting a sequel, even though it will be ten years, like you said, by the time it com- probably comes out, uh, it made twenty three point three million dollars worldwide on a one million dollar budget, so it. Ooh. turned a massive profit and it yeah. was uh it's and then some a lot of people think that it is uh you know uh there's certain people that have called it the best horror film of the 2010s some people say it's one of them at least it's mm-hmm. a big debate there are a lot of good ones that came out in that, that was period. A, yeah a strong time for horror up there um 
I think this. I think that time that was a, re- a time too where uh, horror films were becoming a little bit more creative, and mm-hmm. you know, because this it follows has a lot to say about various different things. It's a really smart movie. It is a very um, smart movie. Um, but yeah, I you know I was you know I'm excited for people who wore it because like I really thought that some people were gonna be like, oh no, why are they doing this? But as soon as that news dropped, so many people were like, it was so unexpected. No one really saw it coming, and they were down for it so i mean color me surprised i I never thought we'd be having this conversation so i think pleasantly surprised with it but um not to be cynical but i i kind of will be approaching it with a cautious optimism but if it's made of the same creative team i mean making monroe is coming back that's great she is great in that role hopefully we get some other characters from the first one coming back maybe not permanently but uh yeah as long as they you know they uh are ballsy with it and take some risks i think this movie is primed to be work. successful. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And then the last bit of horror news is more on the TV side, but um, there is going to be an early development. A uh, TV version of Poltergeist is in development at Amazon MGM Studios. There's no writer attached right at the moment, uh, but um, Amblin uh, Television is going to be producing it, and that keeps it in the Amblin family because Amblin Entertainment produced the 1982 film with Steven Spielberg having come up with the story and co-writing the screenplay and yeah. producing it. Uh, Toby Hooper, of course, directed the movie or Steven, <laughs> or Spielberg, <laughs> or, or Steven Spielberg directed the movie. Uh, but yeah, no exact plot details are available, but it, but it's said to be set within the world of film. That's all they know right now about it. Set in um, the world of film? Film. That's what, yeah, that's what uh, the plot, that's what we oh. know about the plot so far. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, that's cool. Yeah. And uh, the original poltergeist followed the family who moved into a new home, only discovered that it is infested with a horde of ghosts after the ghosts kidnapped their young daughter. The family worked with a uh, parapsychologist and a spiritual medium to free their daughter and escape the ghosts. It was a huge hit when it came out, 121 million gross worldwide on a $10.7 million budget. It was nominated for three Academy Awards, Best Visual Effects, Best Sound Effects, and Best Real Score. Oddly enough, it lost all three to E.T. the Extraterrestrial because it came out the same year. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, it was directed by Spielberg, so it was by Spielberg. Himself, it's kind really. of funny. So yeah, and then this was followed, it was followed by two sequels, Poltergeist 2, the other side, Poltergeist 3, which um, they're both not nearly as warmly received as the original and it was also remade in 2015 but i wouldn't uh Ooh. be mad if you forgot about it because i kind of forgot about it too and so, like, i can picture the cover with like, that weird clown doll clown doll and i yeah. know sam rockwell's in it and if you can make me oh. forget a sam rockwell performance then wow that doesn't, that doesn't bode well for your movie i no. don't remember anything about it like at, at all and i was it, I, it made a decent amount of money but it seems like one of those things that kind of came and went because it was just so probably not as good as the original i guess mm. but i don't know how do you feel about a tv version of poltergeist um i again i'm if it's a limited series sign me up i think a limited series is the best compromise between like remaking something as a feature film or a television series because i like, i don't know if we're what we would get out of seasons worth of television on a poltergeist story but it, depending on maybe the length if it's a tight little mini series i would be kind of excited yeah. for that uh i don't think there's enough info for me yet to really like care one way or another um but i'll be keeping my yeah. eye on that one that's interesting i i didn't remember that until you mentioned it now but i did see your post about that earlier and i was like oh, okay and then i forgot about it <laughs> but i guess we'll see <laughs> it, interesting that it's still under steven spielberg's direction or like inter, um produce it's his like company entertainment yeah, yeah, yeah. entertainment yeah yeah so yeah. for him to be involved that's neat i don't rest i don't think i think that movie would benefit more without a steven spielberg touch but yeah. uh maybe someone in the hands of like oh i don't know maybe some of the creative team behind like paranormal activity or something would do a lot with that movie more so than family friendly spielberg but yeah i mean there's something about it that kind of like under the wrong hands like if it was like too family friendly that it's that's my big issue like i don't care for the original because <laughs> it's way too vanilla for me but it's, it's very light it's very light and i remember yeah. watching it a decent amount as a kid and being like oh this is kind of scary as a kid but then you get older and it doesn't really have really i mean not. i respect yeah. it yeah. as a like it's it's well made um, yes but it's not scary at least not to me anymore i don't 
Um, but there I is do. some like signature stuff from it that's still classic, right? Like Carol Definitely. Ann saying they're here and all that. Everyone that's a wicked like a, moment. I respect the legacy, yeah. the the real skeletons. Clown, the clown, or the clown underneath the bed, the real skeletons. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Like that's uh, and then there's cool. the whole poltergeist curse that goes like along with it. That is right. uh, a, a movie in its own right. It should be, I guess. Um, but yeah, the movie itself, it, like, you, you could tell that like it does have a very Spielberg touch to it where it's like, you know, very kid friendly, but yes, I, mean, I guess that's what he was going for. So, you know, if Spielberg was going to write co write a horror film, that's what we got. So, yeah, there you have it. But I agree, I have, I have a limited series, mini series, I'd be down for it. Uh, horror does pretty well on TV. I mean, uh, yeah, Chucky, Chucky is a good example that's still going strong. Okay, I'm enjoying it. Um, and then we're gonna get Crystal Lake, uh, mm, hopefully I'm after, for that. The, after the strike's over. Um, you know. Stuff like Hannibal's worked really well for TV. Uh, Bates Motel was another one that I thought was a really good TV adaptation of like yep. taking like uh, movie lore and like turning into a TV series that worked. And then whatever they plan on doing with Halloween on TV, I know they eventually want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it. I think it kind of could work for a lot of horror properties. I think Hellraiser would benefit maybe from a TV series too. Yeah. Probably do a You're lot right. with that as well. There's a lot of um, lore in there too to, to spread out over a show would be pretty right. cool. But yeah, that was some uh, spooky season news uh, that dropped last week and today that I thought we could touch yeah, on just a little it's bit. Glad um, we did. Well, I think what we it. landed what we landed on is that we're okay with the sequel to It Follows. Uh, yeah, on the on the on the fence about Black Phone Two. And we'll see what happens with Poltergeist. Mm, different about in Poltergeist, <laughs> but uh, yeah. we're gonna be following that one too for sure. See how that shapes up. Yeah. All right. So um, the final film for uh, our Tales of Horror series is 1978's Halloween, an yes. independent slasher film directed, uh, scored, and co-written by John Carpenter. Uh, he also wrote this alongside his producer partner Deborah Hill. Stars Donald Pleasance and Jamie Lee Curtis in her film debut, PJ Souls, and Nancy Loomis in supporting roles. It's set mostly in the fictional town of Haddonfield, Illinois. The plot centers on a mental patient, Michael Myers, who was committed to a sanitarium for murdering his teenage sister on Halloween night when he was a child. 15 years later, having escaped and returned to his hometown, he stalks teenage babysitter Laurie Strode and her friends while under pursuit by his psychiatrist, Dr. Samuel Loomis. The one, the only, the classic Halloween. Halloween night. A small American town, 15 years ago. Michael? Halloween. I spent eight years trying to reach him, and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. <laughs> I think he'll come back. Exploring uncharted territory. And totally charted. Just talk. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. The only reason she babysits is to have a Halloween.
came home. Um, filming took place in Southern California in May 1978, which is crazy because there's not a, any kind of fall foliage around for uh, for filming <laughs> for filming no. in, Southern, also, in Southern California. <laughs> this was released like only a couple months after it was filmed. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. Yeah, the film premiered in October, grossed seventy million dollars, uh, becoming one of the most popular independent films of all time. It was primarily praised for Carpenter's direction and score. Many critics credit the film as the first in a long line of slasher films inspired by Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho and Bob Clark's Black Christmas. It is considered one of the greatest and most influential horror films ever made. And in 2006, it was selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress as being culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. It also spawned a film franchise, as we know, comprising mm-hmm. of a lot of movies, <laughs> which helped construct an extensive backstory for its antagonist, Michael Myers, sometimes narratively diverging entirely from previous installments. <laughs> Ad- additionally, there have been novelizations of video game, comic book series, and a few other uh, works of art based on the film. So yeah, very influential influential horror film. We've talked about how much we love the movie on well, this is episodes a not dedicated. favorite of one of us yeah. in here, right? This is your favorite movie ever, right? Favorite horror movie? Yeah, uh, it, it, it's favorite horror movie and like in top five, like favorite right. movies ever. Yeah. But it is my favorite horror movie. Um, I don't think I would have any real love or appreciation for film without it. It was something I remember growing up, yeah, seeing a lot. And uh, probably one of the first movies I kind of sought out, like learning about like how it was made and what they did to make it. Right. And uh, I just love that idea of like just a bunch of friends getting together just to make a movie. And, you know, the whole idea of like, you know, interviews I've seen with like PJ Souls and like Jamie Lee Curtis, and they are all saying like, hey, like we were like everyone, actors included, were like picking up leaves off the ground because we knew you have to like bag them up for like another shot. Like it wasn't just like, <laughs> you know, uh, it wasn't just you know, kind of like the behind the scenes people doing it. Like everyone kind of pitched in. Like some people bought right. their own war- wardrobe from like JC Penney. <laughs> like they all kind of like did like their own kind of stuff for the movie. It was not a glamorous kind of. A lot of people said it was an easy shoot. It wasn't like it wasn't glamorous either. It was like very low budget. Um, Three hundred twenty five thousand uh, dollars was the budget, um, and that was originally much lower than that until they got uh, Donald Pleasance. That twenty five a thousand dollars a bulk of it went to paying him for i believe seven days of work which is kind of funny because donald presence uh i don't know probably not the case for halloween too because i feel like he's in it a good yeah a lot more but apparently halloween five uh danielle harris said that she she believes he was only there for seven days uh halloween four he wasn't there a really long time either so this was like you know he kind of was in a lot of these movies just came in did his stuff and left but um i just love the story about how he really didn't want to do halloween and his his daughter was like a a big fan of assault on precinct 13 which is a movie that carpenter did before this and he basically was like all right well you know i kind of don't understand your little movie but my daughter likes your other movie and i'm gonna do it because she thinks you're cool and uh, apparently he was a consummate professional on the halloween set and not at all pretentious about what he was making um a few you know i i think it's so funny that christopher lee was offered this role and wow. he turned it down he turned it down because he was like oh it's like a little horror movie blah 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 and uh he said i guess in future interviews uh that it's one of his biggest it was one of his biggest uh career regrets that he turned it down after he saw it and it was like oh this is not what i thought it was going to be because i guess right. on paper it doesn't sound like it might be anything special i guess right rarely does uh, it until you see the final product Right. Um, originally, it was called The Babysitter uh, Murders. Uh, setting on Halloween night was uh, a really stroke of genius idea because a lot of there weren't any movies, I guess, up to that point that really did that, surprisingly. <laughs> so strange <laughs> um, to think about. So strange. Uh, and that just added its own layer of creepiness to it. Um, again, it's so interesting to think about the movie as a solid one off on its own where. When, you, when you're not thinking about like whatever the bigger picture is for the future installments, no matter what 
whatever what road you want to go down on uh, <laughs> how this works. But like, you know, as one standalone movie, it's not really about anything except, you know, you have that opening murder at the beginning, which kind of sets up like this town was kind of rocked by that. And this kid did this awful thing. Mm-hmm. And there's not much plot set up after that. I mean, you, you know, you have Dr. Loomis and Marion Crane going to, I'm guessing what to like, what are they transferring him at the, at the attempting to transfer him at the beginning of the movie? Well, and... I don't know what they're going there for. So late at night, <laughs> but yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly, they're right. going there <laughs> and they're talking about eventually him appearing in front of the judge, but it is qu- quite late and dark and stormy night. Yeah. The day before Halloween. Um, yeah. I mean, again, like no matter what Halloween movie you watch, it should be like October 30th is like a trigger, man. Cause we talked about that in Halloween four where they were like transferring one the day before Halloween. It was like, Oh, yeah. like maybe, maybe don't. <laughs> no, maybe don't <laughs> this do clearly did not go well uh, the first time, but yeah, it really isn't about anything. It's just like, you know, he, you know, Laurie Strode drops off a key at the Myers place. Cause her, you know, dad's a realtor and like whatever, they're trying to sell the Myers house. And then he happens to see her. And really, that is all it is. He sees her, and like I, I know John Carpenter and Deborah Hill have kind of didn't want to make it the connection, like oh, that is my sister. But what he saw in Laurie Strode in that first movie was something that maybe reminded him of the sister from the opening scene of the movie, which is why he right. became so fixated on following her and stalking her. And in a lot of ways, I think that's scarier than you know a lot of backstory about like oh that's also his sister and mm-hmm. this is why he's doing this i i don't know where you land on that but well i'll get to that this was um and it was only like i've heard and dwelled on this conversation that i'm about to bring before but i've kind of watched this movie for the first time with a in a different lens so like i've obviously watched halloween several times before i'm no stranger to like the work behind it and the story about it being made maybe some details uh would elude me but for whatever reason i guess i never really considered the that john carpenter didn't really envision this movie as being uh the beginning point of such a big illustrious uh series franchise yeah exactly so this time that i because i just watched it uh, again today i this was really my first time watching it knowing that and just picturing it like how he would have made this and that he just probably didn't intend for anything else to become of this story, that it would be bookended and just be completed. And yeah, uh, I guess having watched Halloween two for the first time uh, a couple weeks ago uh, in anticipation of four, I guess I always had assumed that he knew Lori was his sister. I didn't realize that wasn't dropped until Halloween two is that like, sort of shoot in like, I, I got I gotta do something <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah but it's that conversation uh that uh moment in school when Lori's like looking at the window and notices Michael and she's not paying a te- paying attention to the teacher and she calls on Lori and they're having that conversation yeah. about fate, fate. and yeah. that to me I just kind of associate that as like it, it, it was because there's a line about fate stays stand still like while man moves through it or whatever. I can't remember the exact quote, but that to me uh, is touching on how she is connected to Michael and there was nothing that she was going to be able to do to To escape his wrath. And that to me like lends to the idea that they are connected through this familial bond, even though it's not mentioned in the first one. I know that's kind of like I'm drawing a conclusion that's not introduced in this movie, but that is how I kind of approach their dynamic in the first one. I very much am strongly like, believe in that aspect that they are related uh and yeah. i've i guess it's because i always assumed that was the case not knowing because my experience with the halloween franchise is kind of jumbled i'd seen many different sequels before i'd seen two and four um and seen one plenty of times too and seen rob zombies spread throughout there as well and just that was always my assumption is that they're related and i had known this as a kid growing up before i even seen any of the halloween movies yeah. so that tainted my perception of their dynamic but uh that is very much how I feel. So I, a little bit on the other side of the spectrum there, but um, definitely interesting. Whatever way you spin it, their dynamic is uh, one of the better ones portrayed in horror. Yeah, it's interesting too because they're, I have friends who have seen the movie and they need a little bit more motivation behind what is happening. So they mm-hmm. don't really like the unexplained randomness of it. And then there are a lot of people who love the movie for that reason because they think it's scary because it's unexplained and it's completely random and right and there's no real rhyme or reason to it, which is kind of what a real life situation would like that would be if you know 
you were being stalked by someone you didn't know. And you know, <laughs> yes. some, sometimes, sometimes there is no real reason for what these people are doing. And true. Um, so I've always dug that aspect of the movie. I get if you're making another one, like when you get to Halloween two, like my opinions on Halloween two, like go all over the place. Cause <laughs> yeah. I, like again, it's like, if you watch them together, right. It's so weird. Like you watch them back to back. It's like, oh, it feels like the same movie because it looks, you know, the look is pretty much almost the same. Yeah. And, you know, even though they were made a few years apart, like they're still feel very connected. But then like quality wise, there is a shift between one and two where one is clearly like one is is clearly like an atmospheric, almost like thriller. And the other one is more of a slasher movie than the right its predecessor. Um. And I get for the sake of having more movies, you have to, you can't just be like this random guy just going after her for no reason. There needs to be some kind of motivation, right? So I don't particularly hate the sister. I, I, if I'm going to watch one, two, four, five, I'll accept the family ties because right. again, once you, once you get to four and you have Jamie and all that, I still like that angle of the story too. Like now right. after her, like young, young daughter for, similar reasons and and right. i like we talked about on that episode like halloween 4 works for me as a sequel i like it more than halloween 2 um mm-hmm. but but as a standalone i get the 78 movie works better where you just i just don't there doesn't really need to be a lot of motivation behind it it's like it's completely scary that this guy is like following her throughout the day i mean i used to when i used to like it still gets me too like there's not a lot that really happens uh until like we the, like the last what 15 20 minutes is where <laughs> yeah I mean, all <laughs> but, the action is set pretty much but like the whole like kind of watching stalking stuff is creepy as fuck i mean it mm. like really the whole like and just the thought of being in that character's head where she's seen this person throughout the entire day and i wonder and like in my mind when i'm watching it like what is that realization like for her if she even has it like this person has been watching me all day and that's who that was right. um you know that you know it's the the one from across the street that's like while she's in school is creepy. Definitely the one where they're walking down uh, the block and the car drives by and you just see him like kind of lean his head forward and like stare at them while they're walk- walking by. Mm-hmm. And then the one by the hedge is even, I mean, it's just all of them are just like, and of course, you know, most of our friends are like kind of unaware of what's right. going on. Exactly. You know, um, and he's conveniently looking down into her purse when he's standing at the hedge. So she doesn't see him. And then the one where he's in like Mr. Real's backyard, like that one as a kid used to terrify me too, where it's just like she's just like looking out in her back window, uh, back door, and then like that guy is just standing in someone else's lawn, like just looking up at her house. Like that stuff creeps me out more than mm-hmm. so than a lot of the things in the movie. It's just the build up to what right. like is coming. And you can tell, like, with all this like stalking and watching that something is coming, and you're just like really anticipating it almost mm-hmm. like uncomfortable like when is this gonna like hit and right. it's not even just that when he's doing it to her i mean like you know it's like he systematically has to get rid of her friends first like there's like a, a weird kind of intelligence i think that goes along with that where it's not just like he's killing them at random it's like he he knows he needs to get rid of them first to have it just be her like right. it's more to me, to me it's right to me there's more to it than just like i'm killing her friends it's like i you're rendering her without any aid and like that is a creepy thought to me because there's a there's a reason why he goes after them first before he even like mm-hmm. uh goes after her. And you know what? He doesn't really technically go after her. I mean, sh- she comes to him because she's worried about her friends. And like I and I know I'm probably overthinking it, but I was like, I wonder if he's if he's thinking like she will be worried about her friends and she will want to come and see what's going on at the right. house across the street. So there's like a lot of like little things in it that make it a little bit creepier than what's like on the page, I guess, and what's on the surface. Certainly, and I think a lot of that is owed to John Carpenter's direction, too, and definitely a part of why 2 was a little bit lacking, even though he wrote he's not behind the chair, or in the chair, I guess, behind the camera for the second one, and you notice, even though I still commend 2 for what it is, you definitely notice when John Carpenter's directing your movie versus when he's not. So I, I completely agree that, yeah, there's a lot more that his direction does from just the pages of the script that uh, lesser directors aren't necessarily able to convey. And uh, there's a reason, I guess why I think this movie could have been great too. in the hands of different directors, but I think it has a legacy. It does because of him. And um, 
just did wonders for his career afterwards too, even though that wasn't always reflected at the time. It's definitely yeah. solidified his legacy as one of the great horror directors mm -hmm. and why he's one of my favorites. And a lot of that is owed to this movie. And it is, even after all these years, you can, it's, it's tough to really put it on to people that aren't a fan of movies from that era or oh, your friend, your yeah, friend, <laughs> but it's still, there's still such a charm to it that I have every single time I watch it. That is just undeniable. And it, it sucks when people don't appreciate it, but it yeah. is what it is. Uh, I'm going to throw a silly question at you right now. Um, uh -huh. How do we feel about uh, Michael Myers being able to know how to drive a car? <laughs> yeah, I was talking to my roommate about this. Um, for a guy who's been locked up for 15 years, he is quite the skilled driver, and he's pretty and ample. stealthy. Yeah, he is stealthy. <laughs> it's it's a I guess if you call it in, I don't know if I want to use the word oversight. Like something had to happen for him to get to Hadden back to Haddonfield, but and it wouldn't really make sense that he would know how to drive. But I just look at it as like a necessary oversight for the sake of the movie to happen and there's plenty of movies that have many of those throughout them so i don't yeah. it doesn't really bother me it's something that i chuckle at when i see him speed yeah. off in the car on that note though um this was the first time i ever noticed and i had read that for that that sequence of michael breaking the glass with his hand that that there was yeah. a wrench that was used to break the glass and oh, this time, <laughs> first time i ever actually you could clear as day see it on his palm and up his wrist when he smacks the window <laughs> I had never noticed it before. I just read. I, I don't gotta, know what. I got to look back at that. I didn't even notice that. No. Yeah. Oh, you can okay, see yeah. it. His hand slaps a window and breaks it when the nurse girl, uh, what did well, you say her name uh, is? Marion. The Marion. Uh, yeah. The Nancy, Nancy Stevens character. You exactly. She's actually been in the she, franchise a lot. Too. <laughs> she's in She's in two as well, right? She's the one that drops yeah, yeah, the bomb yeah. that Lori is her she's, sister. Yeah, she's in two. She's in H2O and they brought her back for kills too. So she's been in a lot Damn. of these. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, look at it. Uh, next time you see it or look it up, you can see that there is a wrench like taped to his hand. <laughs> it's very, very clear. So the, act, just, so the actor could actually break the window. Yeah, ex exactly. I found it amusing. Um, is it something that bothers you that he can drive or that he's so skilled in other ways? I mean, or? I guess they kind of, I don't know if I want to call it an oversight because they do acknowledge it in the script because like the guy says, for God's sakes, he can't even drive a car. And he's like, well, he was doing really well last night. Like, yeah, maybe, maybe someone around someone here gave him lessons. Right, and I right. guess that's a one way for them to acknowledge it without being like, oh, yeah, we he has to get back to right. somehow. And I mean, yeah, it, it's a kind of funny thing that he he went in there when he was a kid. So there's no way he would even learn how to operate a motor vehicle. Like, right. Whatsoever. How? <laughs> yeah. But no, yeah, I think it's, 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 I think it's okay. Um, might be a silly question for you. Maybe not because you've seen it. Would you even be able to quantify how many times you've seen Halloween? Do you think? Oh, God, I don't even know. I think I've lost count. <laughs> that wasn't even going to be my question. I figured that would be the answer. <laughs> what, what's like your earliest uh, memory with watching Halloween? I was young. I mean, maybe a little bit after Hellraiser around the same time. Uh, okay. And honestly, it, it even it scared me then. It's still... I get uneasy watching it like in the dark now. So, oh, was that right? Eh? Like, like once it's like, especially once it transitions to like you know the nighttime stuff. Like, once he starts following them to the houses that they're gonna be babysitting at, and you're, it's like about the you know you can tell the sun's about to set, and then like by the they cut to that next scene, it's like completely dark now. Like once we get to that stuff where he's like he's now parked, now he's watching where Andy's going, and he's basically has like a vantage point of both homes, so right. we can like that it, it just un, i get uneasy and like it's i guess the idea of like is it something carpenter does in the movie where like you're supposed to be paying attention to someone talking and then there he is in the background like in like the middle of like a door frame like there's that one scene where annie's talking to paul and uh he's in the background at like out of nowhere and she doesn't <laughs> see him but like and he's just standing there and then when she turns back around he suddenly is gone like right know, he, like jumped in the bushes or something <laughs> but he's like it's like those little things that are like creepy before you even get like a full on like real shot of the guy right like, you just you see him in like a bunch of shadow and like silhouette and all that let me ask you this because i was waiting for this moment to happen in this movie and it never did and i remembered having the same experience like one of the last times i watched it i could have sworn and it must just be in another halloween movie i just wanted to see if you would know is there not a shot of him reaching over the heart like in the hardware store you see his hand grab the mask for the first time is it in rob zombies maybe that like, might be I was, rob waiting, zombies. I was waiting for that to happen because i know that like there's that scene at the hardware store where 
uh, Annie and uh, Lori pull up and Sheriff Brackett's there. And he mentions that someone broke into the hardware store and they mentioned the mask and the rope and the knives are missing. And I was, yeah. I was thinking that we'd see that scene before that break in of Michael. There's a scene from one of the Halloween sequels where he's like reaching over, he's in the hardware store and we just see his hand and he grabs the, uh, Who's the actor that plays Captain Kirk? Uh, William Shatner. Oh, uh, William Shatner. Yeah. William Shatner. Grabs the Shatner mask, and that's like how you assume he gets it. And it, it must have been Rob Zombies. I just thought I kept expecting that scene to happen in this one, and it and it didn't. I remember thinking that again, but I have to wait and see what one that is. Are you um on that, on that note, or is that something you would have wanted to see in like the kind of like him breaking into the store and like getting all that stuff? Like when my I remember on that first time I watched it with a friend who had never seen it just like two years ago mm. and um it was after it was after the movie was over and it was like this kind of he wasn't really paying attention to the scene about the hardware store much okay like, yeah. and then he was like and he, and he was like oh wait he broke he that's where he got all his stuff like all like all like whatever he used to like kind of dispatch everyone he got from that store i'm like yeah that's what yeah the scene wasn't just there for nothing there's a lot like, oh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I just thought it was kind of like, oh, like a random way for them to like pull up and like meet her dad, and like it wasn't like necessary to the plot that right. someone broke into this hardware store, but like everything that no, that very was, necessary. Uh, that, that, yeah, that was him getting like basically his kill kits, <laughs> and then we get to see him drive by unbeknownst to Loomis. His back is turned. Like, I love that yeah. scene too. Yeah, that's really cool seeing him drive by. But I don't necessarily needed to have seen or known where he got the mask. The sense is that he, this is a a troubled person, boy, if you will, that needs to have his face covered when he kills people. And I just think it's his mask is badass. I don't think you could have found a more iconic mask in Michael Myers. Love how that came to be and how simple it really is. Just a painted over yeah. William Shatner, like mold of his face, but so, so iconic now. Love, love, love that feature of Michael Myers. Uh, here's something interesting about the, someone wrote on Michael Myers.net. Uh, Cause this is about the, the hardware store. They said, uh, here's something that has bothered me for many, many years. In Halloween 1978, there seems to be a major continuity problem. It all yes. revolves around the theft of Michael's mask. It, I laid out the events of October 31st in a practical timeline, and here's what I came with. It. Okay, he escapes 9 p.m. October 30th from Smith Grove. Between 12 a.m. and 4 a.m., Michael makes his first kill, the truck driver, on October 31st. Uh, also October 31st, between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m., Michael steals the tombstone uh i guess uh his sister's tombstone that we mm -hmm. see later that he uses with uh annie october 31st 7 30 a.m michael watches his sister Lori walk up to the house has the mask on uh the, i mean i don't well yeah i guess he does have the mask on when she walks up to the house uh october 31st 11 a.m michael is outside the classroom has the mask on right uh 215 to 240 michael falls all the girls speed kills has mask on 3 10 right. p.m michael is outside Lori's window prank phone call has mask on uh, watches a, uh, Tommy drop the pumpkin at school at 3.20 p.m., mask on. And then at 4.30, Brackett is in front of the hardware store and says that someone sold a mask, two knives, and some rope. Uh, this is where I can stop. You see, Michael has his mask since 7.30 a.m., but the hardware store wasn't robbed until 4 to 4.20 p.m., so that means one of the two things happened. Michael stole his mask before 7 a.m., but the alarm didn't go off until 4-ish. <laughs> Our hat still has the, has the worst response time to an alarm in the history of all police forces. <laughs> I doubt either of the kids. I just like probably just a cotton it, thing. Rather than I, yeah, exactly. And I had come across that too in the past. Um, just a con. I mean, it is a very glaring continuity error, but <laughs> yeah. nothing that really impacts the film. It, I think they could have worked around that by just saying that they didn't notice the store had been broken in until that time. And, and yeah. maybe the shopkeeper just wasn't working until then and went to open the shop and noticed that it had been broken into overnight. Quick little fix, but doesn't really do anything i don't think uh it's just a harmless continuity error funny though yeah because yeah what that person's think absolutely right his plans were for halloween i mean like he doesn't see Lori. i think do you think he goes on any kind of killing spree like i mean he, i mean he steals his sister's headstone like for whatever reason he's gonna use it <laughs> right like, i yeah. mean is, it, is there i mean like i like is there like a would he just been dormant in his house not bothering anyone until hmm. something like till those to him. kids kids maybe came by that it Loomis been, scared off. Yeah, that could have yeah, been a yeah. whole in an alternate oh, universe that, that could have been the, yeah. the, the premise <laughs> of Halloween. Those might have been the only boys that were killed. Yeah. Um, you know what? Like again, even though this isn't really addressed in Carpenter's version and he probably didn't have this idea when he was writing the first one, 
just tying it back to fate and that conversation that he clearly included this, this, this dialogue from the teacher in that scene for a reason. And that's been echoed in, in by, in tons of horror movies afterwards, hereditary being another one that just like you have a classroom scene, uh, nightmare in Elm street that just sets up and yeah. or relates to the themes of the movie that's being delivered by a teacher in a classroom. And Halloween has that right. scene where they're talking about fate. I just think that there was no matter how or why it's not necessarily important what we could speculate on, but some reason Michael was going to come back to Haddonfield. He had this urge to return at the time that he did. And he was b- always bound to run into Lori. And maybe he had this intuition that she was his sister. And that's why he props up her best friend dead on the bed with the, Oh, the, tombstone, tombstone of his yeah, sister yeah, yeah. like maybe to be like hey by the way like you're my bloodline and i'm coming to get you like who knows yeah. really what he's thinking because he's not um uh, relaying that to anybody but i just think that it all ties back the, one of the most pivotal moments of dialogue is from that teacher who we don't even see is we just hear her yeah. voice as she's picking on Lori, but it's about fate and this sequence of events was always meant to happen in this universe and why yeah. isn't important just necessarily what is is that it was going to and i don't know it's not necessarily a roundabout answer but it has something to no, do I, that, I forces you. that we can't explain yeah i totally i can i can buy that mm-hmm. like it was like i you know a lot of people reference that whole uh speech about fate and even if mm-hmm. you're looking at it as like you can look at it as like hey this kind of like familial tie ties them together and like right fate was going to bring them together eventually or if you just look at it as one standalone movie like this was her fate for on this Halloween night, like this right. kind of like she was going to meet this unsolvable force, and there was going to be nothing that would stop that exactly uh, from happening. So it works both ways. I mean, how if you want to look at it as like a greater picture thing or just like a one movie thing, it, it that's works. sort of how I naturally look at the movie. And I, the thing is, I like both approaches. Yours about it being completely random, and that is where the scariness is. That it could have been anybody yeah. and it just happened to be Lori and he saw her when he did, which all ties back to fate. It could have been anybody walking by, but it happened to be Lori's fate that she was dropping the key off at that time that Michael was already there. But I, I, I always look at it as a having more grandiose implications, I suppose, but both are equally yeah. scary to me. And I've definitely looked at it the way you do and on previous watches and it, I flip flop sometimes, but that's just kind of where my mind is set right now. And I've always admired yeah. it and more so after watching Halloween too. Yeah, I feel you. I, mm-hmm. I can totally understand that. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, how do you feel about um, the look of Haddonfield, Illinois, which is actually just various <laughs> areas of su- Southern California, which actually looks, I mean, they really, it literally does look like small town Midwest, except yeah. for the occasional shots of palm trees in the back. Which um, I didn't even notice. Uh, <laughs> I never know. I heard you talk about it before, <laughs> but I never really taken note of that. You'd never really know uh, as somebody that's from the East Coast, like that looks like Haddonfield could be like rural New Brunswick for me like it looks like my area too like it's very the geography is very similar um i think it looks fantastic i would never know that that's what california looked like again minus the the odd palm tree which again i didn't even cross my mind <laughs> yeah. and i was i, I kept it, that in the back of my mind because i remember you talking about that earlier in an yeah, episode but i didn't notice it's it. like a pocket of like south pasadena that looks like small town mm-hmm. like midwest like there's certain okay. streets do and then like the the houses where they're babysitting that is in hollywood but that the street where they did it on in hollywood that one particular street just looks like mm-hmm. a small town like midwest street right um and it's also weird too because like when i went when i went there with a friend a couple of times actually the the distance from her running from the one house to the other house, like across the street, looks so much longer in the movie. But if then, you were to look at okay. that, if, if you're standing there looking at where the houses are located, yeah, I mean, you just some magic of movie making to make that seem like a much longer. It does seem run like quite than the it stretch, actually is, yeah. but it really isn't that big of a run at all. Um, I think I might post some of the pictures on like our back to blockbuster pages. I have a lot of those pictures and videos cool. when we went the last time. But yeah, it really is like no real distance between the two houses, but. They made that those two locations work really well. That'll be a, and how far is South Pasadena from um, from where I'm at? Hermosa, yeah. Uh, it's like 45 minutes. So traffic okay. can be a little bit longer, but it's yeah. a must see. I gotta get whenever I get over there. I desperately want to go see where Halloween was shot. That would be super, yeah. Super I mean, cool. there's so many good. The, so many spots are in South. Most of the spots are in South Pasadena. Uh, the only ones that aren't are the two babysitting houses. But Lori's uh, home is in South Pasadena, where she's sitting on the 
curb with the pumpkin. And actually, that house just went on the market for like a million dollars, I guess. So, oh, wow. Um, and they always have a pumpkin sitting out there like around uh, the month of October for people to come and take pictures mm-hmm. with it. Um, the cool thing about the area is the South Pasadena, like the hedge, uh, the people that live in the house, whoever lived in those homes, they are told by like the city, you can't remove any of this stuff. You can't cut the hedge down. Like this is a part of like movie history. Like the right. Myers house isn't in the location where the Myers house used to be. They were going to tear it down, but like the city wanted to find a way to preserve it. So they moved it onto its own lot where people can go in and just like take okay. pictures of it. And like that's sick. So they really care about like the kind of having that history of having the movie made there. That's and, awesome that there's an effort to keep that as it is. And um, I will say this, like, I mean, we mentioned the look of Halloween four. I think that that's a really good look too for Haddonfield, mm-hmm. but there's just something about what they did in one. And I'll even give credit to two as well, where that uh, even the areas that they chose to, film into like leading up towards the hospital and stuff like the locations they found in Southern California still feel like small town, like Midwest. Yeah. So like, I mean, it's a testament to, you know, having a good location scout, I guess, but like the make that what I know to be like Southern California, seem like you're in a real Midwest uh, town is a really testament of how they made that look. hundred percent. And I think, and I think it really works. It adds a lot to the, even the stuff in the daylight feels uneasy and kind of creepy. There's something about, the way he shoots just like the locations that is very uneasy. Very the much time so. Nightfall, that's even, you know, done deal. But yeah, I love the overall look of what they were trying to pick. Cause like, also I think at that point, even in 78, there weren't a lot of horror films that kind of depicted kind of small town, uh, mm, that sense of, da- that sense of sense of danger really. Right. Uh, and that probably adds a little bit of a, uh, realism to it that is kind of lacking from horror movies at the time. Um, this movie gets some care a lot uh, to Black Christmas. Uh, yeah, which I have not came, seen. It came out four years earlier. I think you would really like it. It mm. has the same kind of like almost filming techniques that John Carpenter. I mean, there you don't really see a lot of the killer in Black Christmas. It's a lot of POV shots and uh, more okay. atmosphere than anything. It's pretty creepy movie um and i think he did admit to being influenced by it um particularly i guess for the opening shot which is all from like Mm. michael myers point of view like walking up to the myers house where he when he goes to kill his sister right um there's a lot there's a lot of that in black christmas there's a lot of like killer pov um um, yeah carpenter's definitely not shy about his influences um it's no secret too he's a mad fan of howard hawks and he includes quite a amount of, of footage of Howard Hawks as the thing from another world, uh, which yeah. he would later go on to. I've always found that uh, Easter egg, I guess, if you will, quite fascinating, even before I really was that savvy. And he ends I, up uh, remaking it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I always thought, and <laughs> naively growing up, like when I had first noticed that the thing is playing on the TV and then realizing Carpenter went and remade it, I always thought it was just some crazy coincidence before I realized that, no, clearly Carpenter put that there playing on purpose. But yeah. uh, I remember when I was younger thinking, oh, wow, what are the odds? He he he, re- he remakes this movie a couple of years later that was on the TV, but that was just me being a little <laughs> oh, stupid, I guess. A little nerd, <laughs> yeah. But um, I always thought it was really cool that he shouts out one of his biggest uh, – influences by having that movie playing when it does uh i think they show it like on three different occasions yeah. different parts of the movie which i haven't seen howard hawks's version but i would definitely i have definitely either. do it yeah but yeah, the thing is one of my all-time favorite movies carpenter's version of course yep it like flip-flops with this movie doesn't it? or like kind of neck and neck <laughs> it's up there like just in horror in general but the thing is cemented as like my favorite for sure <laughs> nice yeah yeah um uh let's talk some of the characters a little bit uh john carpenter uh said that you know he wrote a lot of the dr loomis michael myers like evil uh mm-hmm. stuff and then deborah hill w- wrote a lot of the uh teenage girl like banter between the friends that was her kind of okay. department um so she really um he gives a lot of credit to her fleshing out or who laurie strode was and who her friends were and mm-hmm. he really fleshed out the dr loomis uh kind of stuff in his connection with michael myers um i'll bring up uh loomis first because uh i think donald pleasant does a really great job and mm. of course he became he became the face of other than michael myers he was the face of the franchise right. up until part six so um it's really a small role in retrospect i mean i guess you we you think about it, he was only there for seven days he doesn't really have like 
it's not like a lot to do, but what he does do is significant. Yeah. He makes you feel like he's in it a lot more than he actually is. Um, his whole speech about that, you know, with Terry Brackett about, you know, Michael Myers and what he kind of saw in him. Like right. that's just a really well-written scene. And also on top of it being real well-written, it's well acted by Donald Pleasant because it's not showy. It's not over the top. This is just like someone that like, saw something truly evil in this person and it is really unsettled him it. yeah it stopped exactly. it yeah yeah um hearkening back to what you'd said about uh whoever mentioned or i can't yeah, i know you just mentioned earlier in the episode but whoever was talking about um him only being there not really being confident in the movie but taking it on you yeah. say it was his daughter's uh, his daughter his daughter was like yeah because she well, liked assault on precinct 13 yeah props to him for he really does go all out for the role and actually like takes it seriously and gives in like a quite convincing performance for a, a limited screen time and, and time on set. So I think it was very commendable for him to take the role seriously because he does um, sort of legitimize how, I guess the, the, the true nature of Michael before you right. actually see Michael really go at it. It's really what you're afraid of is how similarly to uh, Alec Guinness and star Wars, like you don't really understand like, why this villain is so revered or you do, but you get it through the experience from one person that was close to him at one point, And yeah. he is like telling you why you should be afraid of him. And then you see the villain on screen later, Michael, but in the case of Alec Guinness being Darth Vader, and then yeah. you come to see for yourself, like why this villain is so to be feared. Um, random yeah. comparison, but similar approach. No, it, work, it, works. It, it works. I mean, I think too, um, it's interesting because I think you get just enough of, of it in this where like you get enough of him explaining who this person is and what he thinks he's capable of the tv version of halloween because they couldn't because they had to cut certain things for like it airing on nbc and like you know they like right gore even though there's no gore really yeah them, <laughs> no. but they had to cut they had to cut some of the violence so they had to insert new scenes so i guess they inserted scenes while doing while filming halloween too so there's like extra scenes in the tv version of halloween where he has a discussion with like you see that with the doctors and them him explaining why he thinks that Michael Myers is going to be a, a bigger problem. Uh, oh, okay. Down the line. Um, there's also another added scene with like PJ Souls and Jamie Lee Curtis like talking about the dance and like and then also like PJ Soul uh, her Linda talks about how like somebody was following her on the way to Lori's house. So they kind of set up more of like him stalking everyone. Um, okay. It's a little. I mean, the TV version is easy to find but it like it's it's not like it makes it the worst movie it just it, it throws in more explanation than maybe is necessary uh by adding extra scenes um but yeah i think you get enough of what michael represents through how loomis explains him right i mean it's just it's just enough like that you know he like this person is beyond help and i mean the fact like i mean i can't what psychiatrist would just come to a town brandishing a firearm like with no <laughs> real <laughs> no real like it plans on like rehabilitation it's like no i'm gonna kill him when i find right. him like that, yeah. that's like that seems to be the uh the end game <laughs> on on that note and that certainly is the end game what do you make of because carpenter although he didn't necessarily have these grandiose plans for the series going forward what do you make of him making michael I guess like impervious to damage or like immortal, if you will, or like supernatural. Like, do you get that sense from just watching the first movie by itself? Or do you think that there's a rational explanation for why he can get back up and, and survive all these things uh, that the average person wouldn't? So like, I'd never understood that watching it when I was younger. Cause like that, to me, that was just like, that was in line with like Jason Voorhees and like all these other people that you couldn't really kill so, in these movies. Right. It wasn't until I watched like some behind the scenes thing with, John Carpenter and like how he kind of explained it at least for that first movie is that this guy is just like the embodiment of evil and you can't really kill that you can't destroy that which is mm -hmm. why I mean like which is why it makes the ending work so well because after he shoots him and he's gone and then you, you, you just kind of pant like cut to all the places you've been already and you just right. hear him breathing breathing everywhere he was trying to show that like it's still everywhere like there's something where there's no way you can get rid of it right and some people might think that's like a really easy explanation. All right, cool. I mean, but I think that is what he was trying to going for uh, with it, that this person is just like the embodiment of pure evil. And that's why you can't just, and they right. kind of, I think David Gordon Green was attempting to kind of do that. Like in some of his explanations in Halloween kills, like about why you couldn't really 
because I mean, he, David Gordon Green says his Michael Myers, you know, just as a legacy sequel to the original film, is a man, like he is a human, right? But um, there, you know, he seems to allude to the fact that there's more going on there that's not so much like a supernatural, but just more like you know, if there was evil incarnate, it would be that guy in this body. So okay, I can Neat. I'll I'll rock I'll rock with that explanation. I guess yeah, I like that too. Works. I've I think it's like one of the my favorite features about Michael Myers and the Halloweens is that like for for no rational reason this embodiment of evil this evil person is able to withstand inexplicably all this harm uh, to the yeah. sense that like he is borderline biological he can just keep coming back I've always really admired yeah. that and I don't need an explanation to really rationalize it I just think it's a cool trait. Um, but I like how you've just summed it up as it being the embodiment of evil in this human form. And that is sort of what gives him the edge, I suppose. That's pretty I also think it's interesting when he gets, so the first time he gets hurt in the movie is when, uh, she drives the knitting needle through his neck. Right. And the way that, and the way that is almost played is almost like he is confused by what, like, yeah, (laughs) (laughs) like what, what that is. You know, this is like, it feels like this is someone that's never, hasn't felt real pain, like ever. Right, um, and that's kind of like how I kind of took that too. Like it's just like, oh, like you're like, what is this? <laughs> like I've never felt <laughs> yeah. this kind of thing before. Um, so yeah, I yeah, I, I can kind of roll with that. It, it works more, you know, for one movie than it does for across mm-hmm. multiple films. But yeah, after um, the first one, it's very much seems that they really roll with the immortal, like undead supernatural element which i've always admired about michael myers i don't need a reason again like for it to be scary i just find that cool but uh in the context of just the first and even in david gordon greens um there's just something inexplicably terrifying about it yeah i mean homie in halloween 2 gets shot four times when he by loomis and then he gets shot two more times straight in the eyes by laurie yeah yeah. still alive (laughs) (laughs) not even really phased (laughs) yeah yeah. Which is crazy to me. Um, but speaking of Lori, as far as uh, you know, I guess for a lot of people, she is a, the quintessential final girl. Uh, mm-hmm. More, you know, more so in this film than like the you know, Halloween two, but like fully right. fleshed out. And uh, oh, it's interesting too because you don't really learn a lot about Lori, but I guess you just learn about who she is based on how Jamie Lee Curtis plays her. Like she mm. clearly is popular enough to have friends, but she's not like like her two best friends clearly they have other other intentions on like halloween night you know she's she's laurie seems like the kind of girl that would volunteer to babysit because she wants to to maybe avoid doing the things that they're doing right maybe she's She's not comfortable doing this yeah uh jamie lee curtis described her as kind of like repressed too because compared to her friends um but i think a lot of what laurie brings is is through jamie lee curtis performance and i think she's really good in the movie yeah like especially her being um, her like film debut too so. which is really impressive i always forget that yeah. it's actually her first movie um laurie's the character is very much the antithesis of michael really she's pure yeah. in- innocence and wholesomeness and she's got this motherly sort of naturally welcoming and protective demeanor whereas michael just exists to be savage and kill and is evil yeah Agreed. And yeah, yeah. So it's almost like this, like these two very polar opposite things that kind of right crash together. It's a good classic um, good and evil. Yeah. Yeah. This thing that kind of destroys her innocence a bit and like, you know, the kind of safety of her of her life up to that point. Right. She's probably never experienced any kind of real danger or anything Ex- like that. Exactly. In her life. Um, but I mean what's interesting too is why which is why I think a lot of uh you have a lot of female fans of horror films, is that like in uh in this kind of crisis where it's like you know life or death she's not yeah she's scared and she's afraid but then she's also very smart and you know intuitive and right when she has to when she has to fight back she does um she does toss the knife away a couple times when she probably she doesn't yeah twice. <laughs> my roommate my roommate commented on that too like why are you not going for that but i guess she thought the job was done i mean i guess the nitty needle and neck i would be like that might not be enough I probably would have just held on to the knife. Once she gets him in the gut, when she's in the co- closet, okay, I can maybe understand like she he probably dead, but right. I don't know. She does it twice, and like I remember my uh, 
God, my buddy Sean, when we first watched the movie together, when she did it the second time, he's like, oh, stupid bitch. He's like, I can't, he's like, I can't do this. <laughs> he's like, why would she do that? I was like, I was like, I know, I know. Um, that is awesome. But, <laughs> but, but other than that, you know, she is a very uh, strong, capable character. And uh, mm-hmm. I was, I'm always on the fence about, like, when it comes to, like, because I feel like for a lot of horror fans, it comes down to, like, Lori or Sydney from the Scream movies. Like, who is the better, like, female kind of lead in these things? Yeah. Uh, Where do you fall? I feel like Sydney Neff Campbell has enough, has more time to develop across one cohesive timeline, by the way. That's one uh, advantage she has. Like, we meet Sydney as a teenager. We, go, we see her through college, through, like, uh, you know, adulthood. Like, you know, we have various stages of her. Where Lori, I mean... You have one complete image of her here, and depending on what movies you watch, Halloween 2, she's like a shell of her former self. But that makes sense, though, because it's the same night, and she's gone through a traumatic event. traumatized, so, yes. Right. And then um, and then H2O, there's like this person who's running away from it, right? <laughs> trying to escape right. from it. And then in if you, get, if you don't count those movies, in 2018, she's not someone that's really running away. She's like preparing for this thing to come back again, because she right. hasn't Which let it go. Move. I think, yeah. like creatively, from from uh, David's standpoint, I'm a very interesting character arcs. Like, no matter how I guess you look at it, I guess definitely. Um, in both scenarios, the- she realizes she has to like fight her monster. Like in any scenario, you look at it. Yes, like, she has to do that. Which, on that note, um, neither for me, it's neither um, uh, Nev Campbell or uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. For me, it's uh, like at least in, in a one off because I haven't seen all these movies. But like, just considering the first movie alone, like my my go-to final girl is Heather Lane camps, Nancy from nightmare. Oh, yeah. Street. And someone who like very much from the get go in the first movie, like chooses proactive. a very, in, yeah, is proactive <laughs> in fighting her monster and is just does it in a very clever way and finds mostly success. But uh, no, I really like her arc and just that one movie that she, in, like if you're just considering the first nightmare on Elm street, but Lori is without a doubt. She, you know, give her the crown. She is the scream queen um, helps too that. She is, you know, the offspring of Janet Lee. Yeah, 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 that does help. Both both professional screamers. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Jamie Lee Cur- There's a reason why she became a scream queen after doing Halloween. Uh, she has a set of pipes for sure. Yes. Uh, and then as far as like the other side character, I think I think the movie does a better job than most horror movies. Of, of yeah, they're there to they're there to die. Um, they're not they're not gonna Linda and Annie. And I guess I'll throw Bob in there. And too. Bob aren't yeah. gonna be, and Bob aren't gonna be there <laughs> long term. But I think Nancy Loomis is funny as Annie. She's like she's got she oh, like Annie's great lines and stuff. Yeah. And the and I guess PJ Souls, the whole totally and all that, that was all her. Like that's the, just the kind of girl she was. <laughs> okay. And, uh, the it books. was funny that of, of the <laughs> girls, she was she was the name of the girls. She had done Carrie already. Oh so like she was she was the only one that like she had more I mean Neat. cred film wise than like uh Jamie Lee Curtis or Nancy Loomis, uh, and I mean, other than Donald Premitt, Pleasance, of course, right. but, like of the yeah. girl, of the girls, like you know that reason John Carpenter wanted her is because like she was in Carrie, and okay. that was yeah, like, uh, that. and he really, and they also really, uh, I think Deborah Hill was the one that really was like, hey, like with Jamie Lee Curtis, it's like we have this really cool Janet Lee psycho connection, like we should mm. do that. I know they, I forgot what other girls they looked at, but like that's what it kind of came down to. Like this will be really good for our movie. And and she can act. That's Boy, great. Right. <laughs> and then she was able to. Um, do you have uh, any particular scary moment that stands out for you in the movie that's like a favorite or? Yeah, I mean, not, I can't really say anything. In Halloween scares me. Um, but my favorite shot or scene, whatever, I, I boil it down to a shot because when you freeze the frame that I'm about to describe, like it's one of those like seminal moments for me. I just love it. I'd like to throw it on a poster or something. It's when uh, after. Lori, I keep wanting to say Nancy <laughs> after Lori <laughs> discovers both Annie and um oh my Linda, god, the friend. No, oh, oh, Linda, I know so many names no. being thrown out right now. <laughs> after she discovers all the bodies and she backs into the corner and she's like sort of like taking everything in and like panting when Michael just emerges and the, oh, that's the dark, slow, like oh my god, that is such an awesome shot. Yeah, I love yeah, that's probably that, my favorite moment a, in the movie. Credit to cinematographer Dean Cundy, who actually yes. went on to do like Jurassic Park and like a bunch of big Shit. movies after okay. Um you know, he and they they try to re- recreate that moment in Halloween too with the nurse that gets the hypodermic needle in the 
Oh god, yeah. Uh, uh, and it actually does play. It doesn't play as strongly, but it's still kind of creepy. But yes. yeah, that's probably one of mine. Uh, that one. Oh, I remember when I first saw that. Actually, that because you don't see it right away. No, he <laughs> it's emerges like, from the darkness. Yeah, you just see him coming and, to frame. It's also the slow, like when she thinks everything's done at the end, like she thinks he's dead. She's told the kids to like go next door, like whatever, get, go get help. And yeah. that slow, like raise up. Yeah. And then the slow head turn is like super, super uh, sick. I mean, I mean, a lot could be, I mean, John Carpenter gives a lot of credit to Nick Castle. And it's so funny because Nick Castle has said so many times that he asked him like, what's my motivation? <laughs> like, what do you want me to do? And he was just like, just walk. <laughs> but he was like right. that's all I need you to do. But Nick Castle had like a natural, like the way he moved, I guess, yeah. was just genuinely like creepy, and which I think is kind of hard to duplicate. I think Dick Warlock did a good job in Halloween too. Right. Uh, and he was a he was a stunt man, but I think he got the move mostly right. But Nick Castle was just, you know, like there was no motivation really, just like put the mask on and walk from point A to point B, and that's all you're really doing. And now I guess the one thing that he wasn't directed to do was uh, when he stabs Bob against like the the wall, and then he just kind of looks at him like he's looks, a piece of art, like he's just t- t- tilting at him, like tilting, yes. tilting his head like back and forth. That was a Nick Castle thing, and That's that awesome. wasn't something he was direct directed to do by moment. John Carpenter. And too. I think a lot of people, and it's so many, it's so interesting too. As I think fans look at these moments and like build on them as they're a much like a much bigger thing than what they are like oh like why is he looking at him like that and like you know like what's right. going through his head kind of thing right and the fact that he sets up a fucking basically horror fun house for her to find is at the house across sweet. the street like <laughs> yeah yeah i mean like this is it's not this is so, someone who's like a dumb like thug in a suit like he seems like he's really thinking about what he's doing which is not um, something you get when you look at him that he has a brain and a mind behind the mask, but clearly his motivations suggest yeah. otherwise. Um, yeah. Uh, I, no, what were you going to say? Oh, nothing. Go, no, go ahead. Oh, I'm just being remiss. We didn't mention like uh, even briefly the music. What was your, what was your thoughts when you first oh, heard like the man. Halloween, the Halloween score? So awesome. Like there's nothing I can say that really hasn't been said. It's, just as much a character in that movie as anybody else, as any actor, yeah. as any anything else in that movie as a component. The score, I think, is foremost the thing you take away from Halloween. Um, you can hear it anywhere and just instantly know where it's from. I mean, Linkin Park's What I've Done opens with the theme to Halloween, yeah. one of my favorite yeah. songs by them. So whenever I hear that song, I'm reminded of Halloween and it's – even more impressive that it's done by the director himself. So, and I mean, which is a trait he did that for lots of his movies, but something so simple yet so effective and became iconic. It's one of my, one of anybody's favorite film scores, I'm sure. Yeah. But what do you think about the music? I think it might be the best horror movie film score. I mean, uh, I, hands that down. Might be a, I hope that's not like a flex, but like, I think it might I be know. the best. And there's some great ones out there. Yes. For sure. Like, but I don't uh, think like they have like that. You could play the score for anyone, even if they've never seen it, and they are familiar with it. Yes, on some level, like I they don't like kind of know where it's from. When making a list, you go like, "What's the best uh, horror movie film score outside of Halloween?" Like it's just like that is like the the epitome of what you'd want your score to do. Yeah, I yeah. agree. And uh, yeah, it's hard to top. I mean, not just not. I mean, it might be the best horror movie film score. It's act, and I think it's one of the best film scores in general too i mean it and it's so simple too it's like all done on piano yes and like yeah. <laughs> i mean like you know there's no like orchestra or anything like this is just john carpenter uh yeah. doing this thing and uh that is amazing it's like iconic piece of music and not just the main theme it's like all, all the pieces of music are really exactly good. 100 percent. there's not a single score wasted in that movie even the soundtrack yeah. was limited as it is is pretty cool too like i always associate uh blue oyster cults don't feel the reaper with this movie reaper, yeah rob zombie also pays homage by using that song in his 2007 yeah. reimagining which is really cool too so um there was a funny moment again growing up before i really realized where i recognized that song from like i remember hearing the opening to don't feel the reaper and i was like is this the halloween score that i'm hearing right now and i had associated with associated don't fear the reaper with the movie before i'd really uh recognize that it was just it's its own song that was featured in the movie so i have a funny yeah. connection i guess with that song i still love that song even around the fall is when i listen to it the most nice but yeah and, um and I, 
Oh yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. One more. Go ahead again. Because uh, I was going to say in closing, is there anything that you want to touch on that we oh, haven't yeah. got to yet? But if there's something else you want to say before, then no, no. Uh, it actually was a good closing thing. I was going to ask you. Um, I mean, I what did you think about like the actual ending when you first saw it? Like when you know he gets shot and then mm. he's just gone <laughs> at the end um, of it. <laughs> I can't even really pinpoint when I'd seen halloween for the first time i'm not necessarily known for my memory and especially <laughs> movies i'd seen in my youth like that far back i wouldn't really be able to like tell you how old i was um but i've the ending has always been a highlight for me it's one of my i like my uh my dark endings i suppose where the the, the antagonist Dying. sort of wins or gets away Dying. so this is like one of those ultimate examples for me and it's it just i love an ambiguous ending as well it really has all those components of a a bad ending, if you will, that I, that I like. And Loomis yeah. really sells it to me where, uh, <clears throat> when, um, again, I want to say Nancy, when Lori says to him, was that the boogeyman? It's funny how she's emulating the kids throughout the movie, always yeah. being so obsessed with the boogeyman who only comes out on yeah. Halloween when she is now sort of reduced to this childlike terror. And she's in the yeah. presence of an authority figure. She's now kind of representing the child saying was that the boogeyman and his line where he goes as a matter of fact i think it was that was yeah. such a great closing line and like and it's you know it's really it's all in doll peasant's face too yeah uh, before you <laughs> yeah. kind of before you before you see that he's gone and um it's like on one of the behind the scenes uh when john carpenter is talking about how that scene was directed um like Donald Pleasants wanted to ask, he asked him, should I play it as if like, I'm surprised by this or that I knew this was going to happen. And then like John Carpenter was like, well, I'll do whatever you think is best. And he chose, I knew this was going to happen. I was like the look and not be surprised that, the, that he's gone. And right. I think, and I think you kind of see that, that he is not really entirely surprised that he is gone. <laughs> uh, right. And that's probably the best way to put And it's also crazy that Jamie Lee Curtis and him only have one scene together. And that, and that is Oh, wow. It. That yeah. is like their only moment really together. And, that. Yeah. and then in Halloween 2, they're not together until the end of that either. Huh. Like, they, it's just, I mean, other, if you, other than you count the opening that recaps, you know, part R one. But like, no. yeah. But like, yeah, like, yeah, they only have the two leads. So really to her, have, like, he's just scene. this random man with a gun in her house. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah, they really, yeah. She doesn't know. you know it's so interesting that she has probably learned who he is until much later so like yeah, yeah, you know, yeah even in halloween too she's like ah who you showed up earlier like who are you <laughs> like she doesn't know who he is at all right um and that's like just really interesting that yeah the two leads of the movie don't really share like a moment till the end but you know a powerful one though a really cool like good moment for both of them absolutely uh, I'm glad you described it too as like she's kind of reduced to like that it's kind of like childlike terror by the time like uh she's in that moment after you know right. the kids have been like Tommy's <laughs> been like setting up it's like I've seen this like all this right. talk about the boogeyman and she's basically saying you know that doesn't exist blah 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 and then like right now she's just on their level exactly now. yeah as like it's something about like I think this like is her strongest moment in the movie is it's almost like once he realizes that he's gone and I don't think she realizes it at all that like it seems like the weight of what's happened finally hits her and then she just starts crying like in right. her hands like, I, like yeah. it's just like you know this whole thing is finally like oh like i just lost all my friends and i just almost died, died by myself. the hands like, of this yeah. supernatural creature being thing yeah yeah um you know i would ask you what score i mean you probably know what score i'm gonna give it but i, I know and i'm right up there with you man i got nothing to take away from this movie i mean it's a product of its time but even that being said it is timeless um yeah. and there's nothing i feel like it's blasphemous really to take away from this movie it's uh really fantastic watch every time even though it is very simplistic especially by like the standards of decades that came out after this one um yeah it just, but it does everything right, and it doesn't need to be this big extra. Well, that could be why it works so well. Yeah, like, I think you're it's right. It's simple. There's not much. There's not yeah. much like meat to it, but like it doesn't really need it. Like right, you know, just kind of keep it kind of bare bones and as simple as possible, and that's what makes it scary. Um, I yeah. do think it's interesting that um, initially when the movie came out, it didn't really get it got mixed reviews when it came out. But what made everyone look at it differently, I guess, was 
Oddly enough, because I, I think it's good that we bring him up because we've been talking about Roger Ebert not really loving horror movies so much. Okay, yeah. But but the Village Voice was the one of the first uh, people to give it a really positive four star review, and then Roger Ebert was another one. He was the one uh, they actually used uh, a lot of what he wrote about it because he compared it exclusively to Psycho as uh, one of the greatest oh. horror fi- horror films he had ever seen. And then after those people reviewed it positively. People who initially gave it poor reviews went back and re-reviewed it and thought of it differently. Okay. So, it, like people like the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times didn't really like it when they first saw it, and it was in subsequent viewings after other critics were like, "No, you're missing the point." They went back and uh, looked at it again and gave it favorable reviews after that. I don't know how someone else's opinion can change yours, um, but. <laughs> maybe you're looking at maybe you're looking at some well, things they pointed out like i've had that happen to me plenty of times even like with cam he'll point out uh stuff that i just hadn't considered so i i can see why it'll influence but if you, the difference is if you go back and just like i guess are just trying to please somebody by saying that you like something more than you really did that would be the difference but yeah so it's, sometimes people can put you on to f- things you had overlooked or didn't consider in the right frame of mind maybe yeah agreed all right 10 out of 10 for me yeah, uh, I'm with you, man. That's it for you. Uh, not a bad uh, horror movie to end Tales of Horror on. Uh, the horror movie to end it on. <laughs> the, hor- the horror movie. Uh, yeah. I'm really glad that we did this over the last two months. It was really fun. And I'm already um, looking forward to next year. I know. And also, like I said, like one of my friends pointed out, like this is one of the first things that you and I have like planned like together together. So this was right. also a lot of a lot of fun uh, in that regard, too. And we're going to have a lot more of these uh very soon not, not it won't be uh, a That's long right. wait for the next thing that we come up with but mm-hmm. yeah happy to end it on uh this particular film and uh yeah i'm already looking forward to next year now it's gonna sound like we haven't stopped tales of horror because we have some anniversary <laughs> episodes coming coming up that yes it's not it's not our fault um uh, but uh it's how the cookie crumbles to, like, uh, a child's play anniversary episode coming up and then um i guess uh after i mean our, i guess our next new episode uh Will be our will be our two year uh, yeah anniversary episode. So yeah, I, we kind of tease that on another show, but we will be kind of revisiting uh, some movies that we didn't particularly love when we first saw them. I, I will be revisiting Mother. I haven't seen it since I saw it in theaters and made almost all my friends hate me for. <laughs> <laughs> and i it was one of those first movies i think that i had heard you say that you didn't like that i was like taken aback by or like that i really yeah. like, encourage you to see again and i will be watching jordan peele's us uh, as like the counterpart to, to what you're watching and we'll be discussing how that movie maybe has changed uh on upon rewatch because i think we both have only seen each respective movie one time Once. right yeah so yeah. i think that's a fantastic idea it was all gaius's idea and a really neat thing to do for the anniversary of the show um, very much looking forward to that. I'm gonna try and sneak in both watches, but I'm gonna try to get both first. in too, so I can actually be able to like talk about. The, well, yeah, I mean, I've seen us twice, but it's actually it, they were so close to when it came out that I right. don't remember I don't remember a lot of it. Yeah, so uh, I might feel differently about it. Uh, yeah, now too after rewatching yeah. it. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, that's gonna be our anniversary episode. And we have other. We're gonna plan some other little other things for the anniversary just to kind of make that fun. But we thought that'd be yeah. a good thing for. Uh, for both of us to do but yeah um this was fun and i can't wait to do it again bittersweet definitely it i'm is, excited it to go it's like, it's, it's like mourning a loss a little bit like i'm like oh. yeah, that's right i uh <laughs> mourning a loss exactly as much as i love halloween and horror movies uh I, now this is the time of year where i usually watch like big impactful dramas and historical epics exactly and i'm looking forward to get into that stuff again and there'll be new releases to catch like um uh david fincher's the killer i'm really excited to check that out here soon uh when that comes to netflix i don't know if it's in my local theater i gotta double check that actually but yeah there's a lot to look forward to between now and december but no this has been an absolute blast tales of horror uh, i'd say our first one was a success definitely looking forward to next year's and uh we got a lot of planning to do in the meantime for what other sort of limited series we'll be tackling uh between now and then but yeah i'm looking very much forward to it um any closing remarks or should we get into it um, I will thank also playlist for um, they've done yes. a lot of stuff for us, but um, the you know a lot of people I've gotten a lot of compliments on TikTok and on the Instagram reels just about the uh, intro they made for the the video intro they made for our, our reels. Uh, they did that all on their own as it like hey, do you think this would be a good idea. So um, I really want to thank them for doing that. They're really good at like hey, 
like we have an idea or like if you want us to do anything special for your stuff like we're down to do it so i want to thank them uh for that and i also liked i mean i i created our scary scary our intro for tales of horror for the mm. you know the the music one and i got compliments on that it wasn't it was hard pretty but badass I really, <laughs> uh, but i think that is that's cool that i think we'll be able to keep that for whenever we do it again next year definitely so. You Absolutely. Know exactly. Know exactly what you're getting. So yeah, I wanted to thank them because they really uh, brought that up and wanted to create that intro for us. And yes, it really works for our, our real our uh, reels that we were, were doing. And we will be doing more of those too that aren't horror related because I uh, people actually liked those a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, just us asking us you know random questions to each other. So we're not all we're not all scary dudes. We can we can talk about <laughs> something else. Yes, <laughs> it is an important part of our personalities though, and I'm glad that we yeah. have such. <laughs> great amount of time to, to, to dedicate to it but yeah lots more coming sure. down the pipeline without a doubt as always um but yeah no shout out to playlists uh, they've been a big help in influencing how this went for us over the last couple months and we couldn't have done it without them and to the listeners that stuck around and and joined us each week to talk about horror movies thank you guys very much um as you said yeah without further ado this now wraps up our first ever tales of horror series thank you guys for sticking with us over the last couple months where we covered a borderline exclusively horror movies it was an absolute blast i know i speak for both of us when i say that this has been now episode 129 of back to the blockbuster and the finale of Crazy. tales of horror so you guys stay uh, stay tuned to the socials where we'll be uh, posting our up and coming episodes and stay tuned to us for next week where we will be covering it'll be the second anniversary of the show we're going to be breaking down us and mother the rewatches uh, of those movies and discussing how our opinions changed um, thanks again, guys. As always, if you're new to the show, make sure you tell your friends who like this sort of content. You can find us anywhere you guys get your podcasts and anywhere you're on social media at Back to the Blockbuster. Make sure you download the Playlist app on the iOS store and the Google Play store for Android users. Thanks so much, guys, for joining us over the last couple of months. It's been an absolute pleasure. Gaius, as always, pleasure talking about movies with you, in particular Halloween. Uh, can't wait to get into the next things coming, and it's been a pleasure, my friend. Until next time. Yep. Always, my friend. Take care. Peace Take out, care, guys. guys. Thanks for listening. <laughs>